Um, well, welcome everybody, and um, thanks to Skuso for sorting us all out. And um, um, we're really delighted to welcome Professor Mads Andres from the University of Oslo uh, to talk about the topic of um, is the European Court of Human Rights walking back rights? There obviously has been a lot of conversation about this, a lot of uh, speculation that this is what's happening. So um, we're delighted that Mads is going to talk to the paper that he wrote together with Alex Stone Sweet and Wayne Sandholz, um, really arguing that this, in fact, is not what's happened. And um, so very warm welcome, Mads, uh, even in the rainy weather here in Oxford. It's great to see you. Thank you. Um, and then um, we're also delighted to have with us Gavin Philipson, who is one of our research visitors here this term, who's a professor at the University of Bristol, um, who will respond to uh, to Mads's paper, and also to our relatively new, uh, but very welcome <laughs> head of programs, um, Professor Freya Bartons, who came to um, the Bulgaria Institute and Oxford from um, the University of Oslo, uh, and also from the European Institute in Leiden. So we're delighted to have you as well, Freya, to respond. Freya to respond. And as you all know, the program here will be that Mads will speak for 20 to 25 minutes, and the two respondents for around 10 minutes each, and then we'll have Q&A. So Mads, it's over to you. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I'll talk a bit about uh, scholarship on whether the European Court of Human Rights has walked back human rights, perhaps more than actually on the walking back or not walking back or standing still. Um, and. As, as you mentioned, it's two articles with uh, Alex Densweet and Wayne Sandholz, where we are taking issue with arguments that uh, the European Court of Human Rights has recently been walking back um, rights. And um, the starting point for us was uh, this article by Helfer and Wooten, uh, which uh, fitted into a, a pattern of much. Uh, much scholarship on particularly international courts and human rights courts. And, and, and the effect of much of that scholarship is that uh, it drains law of its normative force. Um, it's dematerializing the law, if you like. So you have this endless series of legitimacy discourses. Pluralism, for instance, Nico Krishus is an excellent scholar. But it all ends up with a national as the residual. Um, fragmentation, leaving international law without a core. Uh, comparative uh, international law, Anthea Roberts, extremely interesting and many insights which are really valuable. But again, more or less doing away with large parts of, compar of international law through the the instrument of comparative law um, is a very narrow core of international law uh, left. And then we have Koskinyemi scholarship. Koskinyemi goes in and out of these paradigms and, and um, he's done extremely good and, 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 and insightful work. But the sum of most of his work is, of course, to continue this dematerializing, draining law with its normative force. And then Matson, the I courts. Uh, Driving force it talks about new Nordic realism, which then is an other way of of the materializing. Uh, and in his case, it's European human rights law in, in particular. So, uh, looking at the literature um, and then the Helfer and Wolten uh, article, um, uh, we um, concluded that a, an appropriate conclusion was not that. Uh, the um, European Human Rights Court had, had walked back uh, human rights. Um, to the contrary, well, uh, instead, what, what they have done is not to move forward. Um, and uh, then uh, the court seemed to have taken um, a position of um, emphasizing the importance of restraint, uh, but still, in uh, uh, important cases, taking a robust approach where there has been a breach of, of, of rights. And, and to some extent, you could draw a parallel to what you see in the United Kingdom at uh, present. The, the judiciary is under an unusual degree of pressure, and its response has been to um, signal that the, the judiciary is able to exercise self-restraint, and at the same time, 
drawing a, a line in the sand regarding, regarding core values, and, and of course, in particularly when it comes, in particular when it comes to the uh, important and often unappreciated value of the rule of law. And then our question was, um, how can one, or, or is there a basis for questioning legal scholarship that goes too far in, in urging restraint? And, and our starting point has been that there is a danger in undermining the judicial process and that much of the scholarship has, uh, has these underlying uh, assumptions about state sovereignty, uh, the value of the political process, basically at the national level, and, and the legitimacy, which is then remaining residually and, and, and very strongly at the national national level. So the um, article uh, by Helfer and, and Wolf was interesting. They argue that a series of these high-level conferences um, about uh, the European human rights system states meeting in these conferences dramatically altered the style of the European Court of Human Rights uh, decision making. And, and, and their argument was that the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights had begun to adopt judgment, which then in turn provoked an unprecedented wave of walking back dissents. And um, the way they saw it was that uh, here you have these dissents that are separate opinions that accuse the majority of a grand, grand chamber of um, totally, as they say, overturning prior rulings or settled doctrine in favour of national governments. And uh, they have this expansion conclusion where they say that the standards of rights protection has, have, have, uh, have been lowered. Now, they found the political scientists uh, dream material, if you like. They, they looked at the um, uh, Grand Chamber decisions and the dissents and uh, they started then to count. And um, they found a series of formal requirements for uh, what constituted a walking back dissent. They operationalized that and then they found a very high percentage of walking back dissent. So they say this uh, really only shows that some judges dissenting claims that the majority has walked back uh, human rights. That's all it says. And then immediately after having done that, they say they have walked back human rights. So it's a kind of classic overclaiming on the face of it. And, and that was good enough uh, to take a critical start, taking a critical perspective and go into, into the article. But then it was, was worse because this, this seven or eight, it's, it's one of the tables which have been published as appendices to this, uh, this article we wrote. I, um, I looked at the um, different judgments or walking back the sense they um, identified in the text of the article. Otherwise, it is uh, regression analysis, they count at an aggregated level, but, but where you actually have the facts of the cases. And then the, you see in, in, in one of the tables here that um, they then uh, go through and explain why this case is important, why that case is important. And I knew the dissents in two of the cases extremely well, and I couldn't see that the judges had claimed that the majority had walked back anything at all. So typically it could be a, a new question. Um, now, a minority in the European Court of Human Rights would often claim, they would often claim, uh, it's part of a legal argument, that uh, the majority do not follow precedent, for instance. That's the legal discourse. But, but the cases they had chosen as particularly typical did not bear this out at uh, the walking back uh, at all. So then um, uh, we got all the uh, underlying uh, coding material and we went through and uh, the three people, I mean Sandholz, uh, Alex and Sweet and me, and uh, we, we voted and we found that a very high percentage of these cases were miscoded. And miscoded to such an extent that there was no basis for uh, any other conclusions. Now, having done that, 
uh, we got a reply, and uh, the, obviously uh, they had a critical view on our uh, critical approach, and, and the, they said we had recategorized or reclassified the, the cases, um, and in a sense we had, but we had used their criteria, really in a loyal, as far as we could in a loyal way, and we could not see that uh, these uh, dissents um, uh, did um, satisfy the criteria they had, they had set out. Now, um, what does that mean? Well, it is a perspective on uh, critical uh, scholarship, mainly in a, a political science tradition where you look at courts and you, you find criteria for um, uh, coding and, and counting and uh, it is of course inherently extremely difficult work. So it's not intended to be disrespectful um, of, of the work they did. Uh, so I, I hope we were respectful enough, but our conclusions were absolutely um, clear. So um, now uh, their argument runs into the argument of uh, Mikhail Rask, uh, 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 Watson, who he is, he is uh, the driving force behind the I-Course. And um, his argument is developed uh, more broadly. And um, his argument then is that in the 2010 to 2008 period, where you have these uh, conferences, the Court of Human Rights has then um, completely changed its uh, case law. It has given way to pressure from the states, which he then supports, which he then finds is well argued. And he sees this not from the health and Wolfram perspective, which is the courts has walked back to human rights, bad thing. The way he sees it, the, the court has taken account of uh, the uh, views of the, 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 the states in a way which shows that the UK with the Brighton uh, Declaration, they, they led uh, one of the first intergovernmental conferences and the Danes with one of the last intergovernmental conferences here uh, in the, with the Copenhagen Declaration, that these two declarations then have changed the Court of Human Rights uh, case law. And uh, again, when you go and try to uh, break up what, what he's saying, there is no support. Um, so he, he would talk about uh, the um, uh, Brighton and Copenhagen uh, declarations, which had very, it's the outcome of, of quite a difficult political process where some countries, the um, uh, UK and Denmark, in the lead the whole way, have wanted to restrict the Human Rights Court by first of all developing a marginal appreciation, secondly uh, establishing uh, um, a, a procedural um, deference, which means that when a court in one of the established member states um, uh, have been through the human rights argument, there's a um, extremely high threshold for any kind of review. And finally, that the court should have uh, an extensive political dialogue with the member states, which they proposed in, in different ways. Uh, the um, Brighton conference, uh, which was then uh, driven by the United Kingdom, again, supported by, by Denmark and a, a couple of other countries, they, um, they managed to get into the uh, protocol um, the principle of um, um, the marginal appreciation, which the court had developed in this case law. Um, and then otherwise the formulations in the final declaration are extremely supportive of the court, stating that the member states must uh, put their uh, push, uh, uh, put their weight behind um, overcoming the uh, compliance problems. And uh, the same happens then with the Copenhagen um, Declaration some years later, where the um, court is uh, again strengthened by a series of general statements, and the emphasis is on the member states' uh, compliance contributions to, to, to the compliance with the court decisions. 
Uh, and um, now, uh, when when you have this very critical scholarship, it does undermine the legitimacy of, of the court. To a large extent, what has happened is that people with these critical perspectives would say, here you have the court, it's been subjected to political pressure, it has changed its jurisprudence. Um, the jurisprudence is the outcome of political pressure. We all know that courts operate in an intensely complicated political context. It goes for any Supreme Court, it goes for uh, any constitutional court, and it most certainly goes for the um, European Court of Human Rights. Um, on the other hand, it's not so that you have political pressure, you change your case law, and um, uh, a simple process like that is uh, then describing a court which is basically a political instrument, a political body, and it does reduce its legitimacy, and it has this effect that it really drains the normative force of uh, the court's uh, judgments. Now, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just um, try to conclude a bit on where this could take you in, or take me in my own, own scholarship, because on, on the one hand, you then have this, this critical uh, perspective on um, Helfer and uh, Orton and Nicole uh, Rasmussen scholarship, uh, but, uh, and, and, and this uh, critical perspective on particularly so social science research. Uh, but um, I, I, I think that you, 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 you will have to um, then, um, first of all, discuss the legitimacy, legitimacy of critical scholarship on critical scholarship. So when I then obviously come from a very difficult, different political position from these two other groups of authors, uh, does that mean, make me biased? And, and I, I think that, that of course, is a, is, is a problem I have to take uh, account of. And I would say that uh, I have to have extremely rigorous requirements. I have to uh, be extremely self-critical and look at my methodology in a, in a, in a very cautious way. I think that we have managed to do that uh, in the uh, to, to deliver something which stands up to criticism uh, with the uh, with the first uh, set of articles on the health and Wilkins, uh, um, uh articles I hope we've done so with the the second one as well about the legitimacy attack on the legitimacy of the European uh, Court of Human Rights um, that's a bit more open textured uh, broader in its argument we don't go down and count and recount um, so that's perhaps more open to to, to criticism. Uh, but but, but uh, the, the way I see my own research going, I'm trying to move uh, now to uh, back to the normative. Um, I, I, uh, I I'm interested in looking at the margin of, of appreciation. Janneke Gerhardt wrote about the margin of appreciation as um, she says an empty rhetorical device. Now the margin of appreciation is something in human rights law, the European Court of Human Rights um, establishes in the 1970s, when it goes into the additional protocol to the European um, Convention on Human Rights, it is a well-established doctrine by the European Court of Human Rights. Is it an empty rhetorical uh, device? Well, you have to analyze it more closely. If you work as a scholar or as a lawyer, it's extremely difficult to, to deal with the uh, margin of appreciation. Um, it has not been subject to the same rigorous analysis as most other procedural and certainly not most substantive rights have been. So that's that's an important thing to go in. And then Janneke Gares in an article in 2018, she also looks at the relationship between the marginal appreciation and incrementalism. So the European Court of Human Rights is of course an, a court which develops human rights incrementally. What effect does the marginal appreciation have on an incremental development of human rights? Could the marginal appreciation stun incrementalism? Yes, probably, but it has to be worked out and, and studied. Uh, so um, there's also quantitative studies to do there. Helga Mobik uh, Stensig wrote uh, an article just published um, about uh, the marginal appreciation. She counted. 
and she found that actually the references in the course practice reached a peak in the 1980s and 1990s. There were fewer references uh, to it in the period of the interlock in Brighton and Copenhagen, these intergovernmental conferences of the 2010s. And then she says um, the area which is particularly interesting is perhaps now the inadmissibility decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, because as we know, they refuse on grounds of incompleteness or uh, having no reasonable uh, chance of, of success, um, some 90 something percentage of all applications. So that, that's one line of research on the margin of appreciation, building, I think, there primarily on obvious quantitative work, but taking it into a normative dimension and um, back into a normative dimension. And then that goes uh, perhaps also for proportionality. How does proportionality now work? This is it's a huge catalogue of endless variety of proportionality tests in the European Court of Human Rights case law. And I, the judges seem absolutely confident about using this or that proportionality test, but from the outside, it, it's a difficult. So that's perhaps a parallel process to cause the margin of appreciation and, and, and proportionality is closely related. And, and other issue is in relation to rights balancing, uh, where you have, at least if you read the court's decisions, the way they have approached uh, conflicts between, say, Article 8 and Article 10, privacy and freedom of expression. They say that uh, when you are then not undergoing a, undertaking a proportionality review under Article 8 and Article 10, but you're balancing the two rights, that in this value assessment, you have a particularly large margin of appreciation, wide margin of appreciation. So then to go in and, and, and fit that into a broader analysis. Then um, uh, we have the external perspective in the UN Human Rights Committee where uh, you know, uh, trying to introduce, God, he's a spokesperson for a general principle of marginal appreciation you know, as a general principle of international law and as a member of the UN Human Rights Committee and uh, chair for a period, he worked very consistently to get the Human Rights Committee to accept the marginal appreciation, which he did not. But are there many decisions, many areas where they picked up elements from the margin of appreciation? Well, uh, that, 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 that's another project that I'm working with, which I think could provide an uh, excellent perspective. And the last point is, of course, to go back to some of my earlier work on the national implementation. And, uh, and then, of course, this national implementation, that, well, first, when you implement. Secondly, when you get the decision back from the European Human Rights Court, all of these places, all these processes would allow to opening up and, and giving more room for national authorities if you apply the margin of appreciation, uh, so you can get double and treble and quadruple margins of appreciation, and then when you put it in with, with a proportionality review um, undertaken first by the authorities, then uh, you see that uh, this again is, 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 is an area which uh, requires uh, more research. Not only it's very helpful to do the quantitative um, uh, investigation, and I hope that just continues, but, but, but also to go in on the normative issues. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. That was fascinating. Mike Gavin. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting me to um, actually discuss. And I learned a huge amount from reading the uh, articles um, for this session, the two pieces by um, Matt and his colleagues, Sweet and Sundholz, and the work that they seek to refute by um, Pat and Voten. And I certainly think your critique of, of their method is a, is a strong one. Um, and I found it overall persuasive, but I was asked to. Uh, to sort of be critical and, please, and put please. counterpoints. So I'm going to make some points of either perhaps, well, the first one I think is more, more almost of nuance, so you'll probably largely agree with it. But I think I'm largely in line with analysis that the, the notion of walking back rights needs to be treated with great care. And I think both sides of the argument, um, yourselves and 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 uh, the Boyton, seem to assume that Strasbourg, if Strasbourg departs from a previous precedent in a way that favours the state party, that equates to walking back to rights protection. In other words, Strasbourg changing its mind in a way that favours the state is, is walking back to rights protection. I think that needs to be challenged. And I'll use the Animal Defenders case, one of the ones you looked at quite closely, which was on the political broadcasting ban in the UK. And a surprising result where Strasbourg 
for the first time the UK Parliament had, had, had been issued with a negative statement by the government, in other words they couldn't. In continuing the broadcasting ban, the government said we can't say that this is compatible with Article 10, we, we think it may not be, and that was based on the BGG decision. Um, so, first point to make is that I disagree with your argument in the article, and indeed with Judge um, Bratzer, the United Kingdom judge, on one point. I think that in that decision, the Grand Chamber did quite clearly depart from BGT in Switzerland. And I think that case was logically indistinguishable on the facts. And unjustifiably, the court pretended that Murphy and Ireland was the more apt precedent. Um, and I think that, <coughs> apparent from Murphy and Ireland itself, it was concerned specifically with the ban on religious advertising. And in Murphy, the court up expressly upheld the ban on the basis of the wider marginal appreciation because, quote, Murphy concerned, sorry, quote, intimate personal convictions within the sphere of morals or religion. And it said it's this marginal appreciation which distinguishes the present case from the case of BGT. Whereas, of course, the UK case was exactly the same as BGT. In fact, even the facts on that, it was an animal charity um, wanting to make an animal rights message work was almost identical. So I don't think there was any colourable doctrinal reason to prefer Murphy and Ireland. Um, and therefore, on doctrinal grounds, you just have to say the court, in effect, acted as if BGT was a mistake um, and took a new path. Um, so I don't think there was a doctrinal case to follow for not following BGT. As, as, as Jake Robotham says, the case was a, was a surprise mm -hmm. in that regard. And that could have been the view of the British government as well when it, when it introduced the legislation. But, and this is my key point, I'm not sure why you're so anxious to defend the court from the charge of having departed from BGT. And this is why this case illustrates my first key point, that departing from a previous precedent isn't necessarily walking back rights, even where the departure favours the state. On animal defenders, both Jake Robot and myself and Jeff King, um, as, as free speech people, both believe the VGT approach was actually a mistake mm. in terms of producing the best free speech environment for a flourishing democracy. So I would argue the better analysis is neither that the case walked back right because it, re because it refused to follow VGT, which is what Heffler and Bowden argue, nor that it actually it justifiably chose a better president, Murphy, to follow, as, as your article claims, but rather the Grand Chamber recognised the VGT approach was mistaken for the reasons given by the UK, the then UK Apex Court, um, the House of Lords, which you could say is a successful example of dialogue between the Strasbourg Court and member states. Or you could say it was just a pragmatic decision that the, the Strasbourg Court recognised that this was a dearly held principle that cut across all, all the political parties supported it, um, as did the judiciary. So it was a kind of unanimous view by the British state, this worked better for Britain at least. And um, it just decided to defer to that on, on pragmatic grounds. Um, or, or it did the kind of subsidiarity um, sort of procedural dialogic deference by saying, well, OK, we don't agree with the UK, but it's done a really thorough job as Jeff King highlights, of kind of working through the Article 10 arguments and justifying the ban on Article 10 grounds. Um, and we could simply say in, in a subsidiarity way, we'll, we'll, we'll defer to that view. But I think on any account, um, it did walk back BGT, but I don't think that that should be correlated with a, with a retreat on, on, on rights. So I would take a slightly different view from, from both of you there. Second third of points are a bit broader. So my second point, I mean, and this sort of came, came up in much of the literature, this idea of the Strasbourg Court as being a constitutional court for Europe. Um, and I've sort of dipped into the literature a bit on it and read around it a bit, and I understand some of the arguments for it, and obviously it's embedded in various ways through the, indirectly via the European Union, and in, in the UK, for example, via the Northern Ireland, um, the, great, sorry, the Good Friday Agreement. I do think we have to be careful with labels, and I get a bit worried about theses that directly compare the Strasbourg Court with constitutional courts like, say, the Supreme Court of Canada or Germany or, or the United States or, or others. I just think reading of judgments that there's always an awareness there that its position is far less secure than that. Um, it exists as long as it maintains the goodwill of, or at least the acquiescence of the states. So I see it above all as a pragmatic court which will protect rights where it believes states will acquiesce, at least acquiesce in its decisions, but it's not prone to push its fragile decision too far. And it is, of course, led often by consensus among states. If you compare that to a national court made up of, of only of national judges interpreting, applying a constitution kind of drafted specifically for that particular state and reflecting its political and cultural and legal values um, and rooted, rooted in, in, that, in that country. It's not the same. The Strasbourg Court is an international court policing adherence to international treaty, often entered into by states without popular endorsement, um, certainly as, as with the UK, 
required to adjudicate upon claims arising from a bewildering variety of different legal um, and cultural systems. So it's not surprising it often uses a much more restrained form of review. It is operation of proportionality is often much less rigorous than say the Canadian Bull, as many people comment. Um, it often ducks out of questions of acute political sensitivity. I think that the SAS case is pure pragmatism. I don't think the reasoning stands up to, I don't, I don't think it should really be taken almost as, 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 a, as a, I don't really think it's a, a good faith judicial reasoning project. I think it was just a kind of, we're not going to push France on this. I mean, maybe that's cynical, but I, I think in a way that's both realistic and legitimate for the court to do. And I think that's relevant to your argument you make about the Brighton Copenhagen summits. And you say it, it, it the, to almost quote, you say, it didn't, those did not generate a credible threat to the court's power, power and authority and thus could not, could not have cowed the court into a more deferential posture. I think that's perhaps putting it a little bit too strongly. While I agree that the outcome of the summits themselves did not threaten the authority of the court, they can be taken to have sent a kind of clear message to the court that if it did not appropriately restrain itself, much stronger threats to the Council of Europe system up to and including withdrawal, at least by the UK, which has been, you know, rumbling away as a kind of a distant threat for, for sort of well over a decade now, might well occur. And I'm also not quite sure that talking of the court being cowed or intimidated by threats is quite the right way to put it. As a pragmatic court, the way I read its judgments is that it constantly balances the need to uphold kind of good minimum standards of human rights compliance across Europe with the need not to push states too far and thus threaten the integrity and workability of the Council of Europe system. So, as you said, all apex constitutional courts kind of um, work within intensely political environments and can be quite canny to them. But, I'm, but you said, and the Strasbourg Court is no different, I think it is somewhat different. I think it is, it's, it's different position. I mean, the UK can withdraw this by lodging six months notice. Um, you know, no state and no, no part of Canada can just withdraw from the Charter or, you know, a, a, <laughs> or, you know, a part of Germany. Um, and, and for most countries to change their constitution to get rid of their actual Bill of Rights system, you know, would require some, as we know, some some major um, process to go through, often, often extra majoritarian. So, I think for the court to back off some, from some of its previous decisions, um, I agree that it, it could be more honest about that. And, and in that sense, I, I, I'm a little bit sympathetic to, to the thesis that you you attack, because I think the court, I think the court. Um, is, is not always transparent about it. And I think Animal Defenders is, is an example of that. And I think ASAS is another, is another example. But I think that's justifiable given that it sees it has a dual responsibility to uphold, to keep the system going. And that involves not pushing states further than they're willing, I think, to, to accept. And the final point I think is this thing that occurred to me as, as we in the UK confront this sort of ongoing populist push by the, by the British government against the Strasbourg court and the current proposals to kind of prevent really domestic courts from, from doing the job that Strasbourg would like them to at the domestic level, which I think is counterproductive in various ways. Um, but also it, it, there's, there's been a lot of talk, academic talk recently for many decades now about sort of third wave um, styles of constitutional review um, in which neither the courts nor the legislature are, are supreme. So sort of rejecting say the, the, the German or, or, or US um, approach where the courts clearly have a supreme authority and also protection traditional kind of sovereignist approaches like Australia or the UK as it used to be, but finding a third wave in which you have a collab collaborative or a dialogic or, or new commonwealth system in which you divide responsibility between them, you give the courts a strong role, but you allow either for legislative overriders in Canada or for the, or for the parliament simply to, to not act as in the UK or <coughs> some of the Australian bills of rights. And I think there's often an oddity, especially in the UK context, when we, we, defend the, we defend the Human Rights Act precisely because it doesn't give judicial supremacy, but we then are not sure how we're going to defend the Strasbourg Court, which, which in effect is a system of judicial supremacy um, and isn't actually a dialogic system. And of course, member states have discretion about how they implement judgments and Council of Ministers is often quite, is often quite um, you know, handy in negotiating that as, as with the prisoner voting saga. But in the end, it's still the ultimate constitutional authority of the, of, the, of the Strasbourg Court is there, is the final word in the way that it isn't in democratic systems. And I think scholars who, who, whose own constitution doesn't reflect that sometimes forget that we need to make the arguments uh, against the, you know, the, the mainstream position. It's not a right wing extremist position to say that democratic legislature should have the last word. It's a very mainstream academic position, you know, very much promoted by Jeremy Walton, for example, recently. 
And we need to find a way of making arguments to, especially in, in this country, to, to justify mm. and explain the continuing final word, if you like, of the Strasbourg Court. Um, when we're more used to making arguments about sort of dialogical, collaborative, or third-way systems. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Thank um, yeah. Great. Um, I'll keep it short because I know that many of you will have questions as well. And I'd like to start with a disclaimer, just so everybody knows. Mats is not only a former colleague of mine, he's also a very good friend of mine. But <laughs> having as, said that, having said that, um, as you know, Senator Fulbright once said that criticism is can be the highest form of patriotism. So I also think that a critical approach to my friend's work is actually a sign of true friendship. <laughs> so I have come up with six. Um, no worries. <laughs> no, 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 they're not, not, not more sort of things for further reflection. And the first one is that um, I, I, I reread your work, listened to your, your presentation. I, I think it's interesting how you, on the one hand, look at these high level declarations. Um, and on the other hand, you look at the court's behavior, whereas I don't think that the two are necessarily linked. But the two are both are very, very interesting. Um, and I do wonder to what extent the, but I do wonder to what extent the high level declarations are a, a threat in and of themselves. Um, and whether we shouldn't rather look at developments at the domestic level, which I understand are a lot more distributed and, and, and difficult to, to sometimes um, kind of catalogue. Um, but I think we do see political populism rising and, and sort of, you know, voices against uh, the, the, the judgments of the court. You see that executive um, officials refuse to cooperate. Courts are just plainly some domestic courts disregarding European Court of Human Rights case law. And I wonder to what extent the high, the high level declarations, which are actually, as you say, quite, quite positive for the court, whether they reflect the real pressure that is on the court. I think the pressure doesn't really come from them. The pressure comes from everything that is going on at the domestic level and that is actually blocking implementation. And I would be interested, but I realize that's not purely a, a legal question, but you know, there's, there's at least you know, one, one and a half political scientists uh, that you, you're working with, whether there's a kind of chilling effect on the court that, that creates an unwillingness for the court to develop the law further in a way, internalizing its, its increasingly weakening position. And I'm not saying that they have already done that to an extent that it affects the case law, but I wonder whether, whether that kind of effect exists. And that is linked to one of my own, um, you know, bugbears, which is the election of judges. To what extent do you even get to the court if you're taking a strong stance against what states are trying to, to, to get away with, because in the end, this is a political election. Mm. I think, well, officially it's all merit, of course, but, you know, if you follow these discussions and these elections, it's not just, I would argue it's not just personal uh, merit. Now, linking that to, to, to the, the, the way you approach to the topic, the methodology of coding, I wonder whether that's maybe a bit too too simple a way of looking at what really are complicated judgments and whether then in the end you, you're you're fighting about well fighting you're discussing two different ways of bean counting in in an area where you it might just not really give you the the insights you, you you're looking for particularly if we're talking about decisions or, or dissents that are not not explicit about walking back or overruling and, and you have to kind of interpret interpret the silence so in a way, Helfer and Buddha may be wrong. That doesn't automatically mean you are you are right. And it's, it rings very convincingly. It's just I wonder whether maybe, and as a third point, whether this is really at the core of the issue, whether it's really that black and white about walking back on, on, on rights, whether it's not rather rebalancing rights. Because on one hand, you might have the right to say political expression, for example, but I think there's also expressing a political opinion but there's also a right for the public um, to get unbiased info on, on, on the BBC or, or you know, whichever, whichever other station um, and not to be bombarded with political ads just to, to, to focus in on, on, on one of the cases. So is it, is it really, can you speak of walking back or is it rather a rebalancing where the court is giving more importance to one right, not necessarily an individual's right, can be a, 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 group, a collective right, a group right, a public's right, against you know, one NGO's right to run political um, ads. I'm looking for point four. Uh -huh. 
Um, you, you use a number of terms, and, and, and Gavin already referred to that as well to some extent. Um, constitutional court, multi-level, quasi-federal legal system, and I wonder to what extent this, the, the, the use of those terms are, which are traditionally more linked to state developments, are really a kind of semantics that might cloud the, the, the debate. And I'm very much of a pragmatist. I want to see sort of where, where, do, where do we want to get with this? Or what, what is the objective of the whole system? And then to, to categorize things in terms that might you know, create a lot of opposition among among readers. I, I wonder whether that is really, really helpful and whether that's really, really necessary. So I would say, you know, whether the court is constitutional or not, it doesn't matter. Does it protect human rights? I mean, for to put it in sort of very simple terms. Then um, a very small question. You, you focus a lot on, on Denmark and the UK, to some extent Eastern European states, and I would be interested in, in hearing more also about Western and, and um, Southern European states, because they're, they're a bit more absent. I mean, they're not absent in the case law, but they're, they're a bit more absent in, in, in the paper. And I think the debates are, to some extent, slightly different. And then my final um, point would be um, one, of, one of, again, one of my, my own research interests is to look at how systems of dispute settlement are functioning across the board, international systems. And a lot of the criticism that you that you analyze here on criticism of the European Court of Human Rights, you find that elsewhere. You find that when you read what is said about the World Trade Organization dispute settlement uh, body, you find that when you read about investor state um, arbitration, essentially states want to take control, even though they are both parties to the case. They, they also, to some extent, want to want to step into the role of the judges, and they, they want to make sure that they determine the outcome. Uh, which, which of course is, is, is yeah, creates tension. And I was wondering to what extent you think that what, what you say here can be extrapolated to these other international dispute settlement mechanisms where you have states that are becoming much more, okay, we want control. If we lose a case, we, we drop the treaty um, because we have an overriding interest and it's up to us to interpret the treaty. It's not some, you know, petty bunch of judges that can determine what something means. <laughs> Um, and also the, the responses, how do, how do courts deal with that? I, of course, and I realize that's the hardest thing because judges are known for, for their discretion, so they will very rarely go step to the, <laughs> publish their thoughts on, 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 on this, particularly not while they're judges, but to what extent are court responses similar? To what extent they're different or to what extent are they just absent, I would say. But I realize that goes way beyond um, your paper, but it's it's something that I, I think is um, quite interesting. I hope that leaves enough time for, for, for other people, for you to respond and for other people to ask their Thanks questions. Yeah, that, that was great. Lance, would you like a quick response? Quick to response. Your... <laughs> yes, yes, you have one you minute now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree with most of the points. Um, just the Dan Mel Defenders is a well-known English case, you know, so mostly many English people feel very confident about that. So there there were two chamber judgments, which when oh, I had these technical arguments, two others, uh, well, perhaps they didn't warm to it because it was too technical, but, but it's in the documentation which is which is published, you know, on the, on the web with it. Yeah, and, I, and I then say that um, you have uh, this VGT case, as you say, which is an important decision, and you have this Murphy uh, case. Now, VGT, the Swiss case, and the Murphy case are both chamber judgments. And animal defenders is a grand chamber judgment. Mm -hmm. So if you have a position where you have two chamber judgments, go this way and that way, isn't the proper role for the pictures? Yes, of course. Uh, but isn't that so that you then have uh, uh, you have to do the administration of all yes, the yes, so broadcasting? I'm just being asked no, no, no. what's on the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's perfect. Okay. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, has has to be uh, so, so 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 that uh, uh, then um, you have uh, one chamber judgment going this way, one chamber judgment going that way. Isn't the proper role of the grand chamber to choose between the two? That's a technical argument I have here. Now I don't like animal defenders. They don't like animal defenders, 
but that they don't like animal defenders, does that turn it into a walking back judgment? Now, we would like the court to go this way. It didn't. And we can argue, I think, extremely well in terms of precedent. And, but can we then say it's walking back? No, we can't. And just, just t t t take to the criteria. Um, so, you know, what, which we then had, you know, as it goes to you too, you know. To be counted as a walking back judgment, the Grand Chamber or, or a walking back dissent, you know. Um, uh, there must be a breach of an existing precedent. The minority must claim that the majority has been in breach of uh, an existing precedent, restricted a qualified right, or um, expanded the regulatory authority uh, of state officials to restrict the scope of a qualified uh, right. You know, that, that's the main mm -hmm. thing, yeah. And, 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 and that's what we just tried to do, and operate, sure. that's how they operationalized it, no, no. and we just applied it, and. When we look at it, it does not take you. Know? I would just reject breach an existing precedent as equating to walking back rights. Because the court can get things wrong, and if you breach precedent, great. I you reach agree. a better decision. I totally agree. I would agree with you on that, but we didn't have to. No, I know. We you were just going to show methodologically they had miscoded, etc., yeah. etc. Et anyway, so 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 that 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 was the point. But otherwise, I think I I, I agree with most of the things. Um, you said, and uh, but then also this idea of venture, uh, then the um, constitutional, the domestic court. You know, I was in London. I was in England when, um, in the beginning of two thousands, they had this anti-terror legislation. We're going to keep people in endlessly without mm. uh, being brought to a judge court. You know, so there were was it ninety days or something. Mm. What terrorist suspect? Some kind of home office decision being kept in for ninety days. I have to shout it out: ninety days. That was what the legislation. Uh, they originally planned and then they pared it down and they ended up with 20 or something 28. like that. 28 days. Oh, 28 days. We could shout that out too without going before the judge, you know, a pure administrative mm. discretion. And then uh, uh, the Home Secretary at the time, <laughs> when, uh, well, first of all, he invited Bingham for a conversation in the Lords or in the in Parliament or wherever. He wants to have lunch with Bingham, who was the, the senior law lord, and discuss things over with him. Bingham said no. And then he said, Supreme Court has ruled, or oh, House of Lords has ruled this way. Are we going to follow it? No. We're not bound by that. We have support from the legislature. The legislature has decided, or we are not going to, to follow uh, a committee in the House of Lords, you know, where the Supreme Court has it. So, anyway, and then Boris Johnson. You know, in his farewell speech there in Parliament, says he he what, what, he did something. He took a stand, or he he, he fought Brenda Hale or something. I saw like. Brenda Hale. I saw Brenda Hale. <laughs> you know, um, well, so, so well. No, but I agree, the appellate body is of course not functioning because the U.S. does not nominate judges. Um, it is uh, they are uh, of course marginal in some way, you know, respect. But then, when you say these. Um, uh, high-level conferences. The point here was that you have these high-level conferences, they discuss, and then uh, what can they do? Well, what they can do, for instance, is that they can propose amendments. You know, you have these additional protocols, which are amendments to the uh, European uh, Convention on Human Rights. And, and they did. And they took in what was then well established in the uh, jurisprudence of the court. And then they add in these declarations very clear statements to the fact that it supports the court and the main issue now is for member states to comply. Now, that's the outcome of what the Brits and the Danes had. A bit like, you know, the Home Secretary, uh, uh, what was the name at the time? Um, yeah, anyway, uh, 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 Tony I'm sure was brought in. And then, and then, and then, and then, uh, uh, yeah, uh, they can change things in legislation, if you like. Uh, but here, uh, these countries, these extremist countries, the UK and Denmark, did not get uh, the majority of countries alone. Uh, and of course, you probably need, you need unanimous decisions there, so it was hopeless from the beginning. Now, that takes me to your other point. What about these other countries? You know, Germany. France, Southern Europe, Spain, Italy, Greece, those countries did not support the UK and Denmark. I come from Norway. The Norwegian delegation supported the Danes. The whole 
Swedes were more like the southerners, hold back, held back a little. Eastern Europeans won't mess up the European Human Rights Convention and won't let the UK and Denmark get away with it. And as we know, there was no it was terror, and then it was immigration. Mm. Those are the two things. And, and, and in the proposal for the uh, Danish, uh, from the Danes, for the Copenhagen Court, uh, Declaration, they put in that the court should be particularly restrained in dealing with immigration. Because these were such politically charged issues, you know, and what is, well, uh, I, I, I know several of the Danes who were involved there, includes Mikhail Rasmussen, by the way, mm. um, and how they could believe they could get these countries along and thank God they didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Was there anything on your points I missed otherwise? But maybe this is southerners. And the alphabet soup, I agree as well. It could be too much uh, terminology and, and concepts which are a bit vague. But what, which have we put into our article has been put into it by the others, and we provide our replies. Well done. That was a good response to lots of really important questions. So I want to 